equilibrium in the ADS model will help us explain the business cycle fluctuations that we see. Short-run equilibrium in the model is simply where your AD and the short-run AS curve intersect each other, so at point E in this diagram. This is also, remember, the level of production at which your aggregate output supplied is exactly equal to aggregate output demanded, and we are assuming that to be currently at $1.8 trillion. The inflation rate corresponding to this level of production is your equilibrium inflation rate in the short run. Note I have not drawn our long run aggregate supply curve in this diagram. So currently we are not concerned with whether we are in a positive output gap or a negative output gap. All we are concerned is what defines short run equilibrium. Short run equilibrium is simply where ADAS intersect and give us our current level of GDP. In contrast to this, our long run equilibrium would be if your short run intersection of AD and AS happens to be at the same point as your potential GDP. So let's say if our short run equilibrium Y star is 1.8 and our potential is also 1.8. That means we are at our long run equilibrium. And that's what I'm showing in the next slide. We have over here our intersection of short run AS and AD at point E. Now this short run equilibrium point is giving me my current GDP, which also happens to be my potential. Your long run AS will always be vertical at your potential level. We can now look at situations where your short run equilibrium GDP is not the same as our potential and see how the economy self corrects itself. So over here, I have my short run equilibrium happening at point E1, where my aggregate output supplied in the short run exactly equals aggregate output demanded and our short run equilibrium GDP is Y1. Inflation is currently at Y1. This GDP is a lot higher than my potential. So the economy is facing a positive output gap, also referred to as inflationary output gap. In the long run, remember, wages are not going to be sticky. They will be fully flexible. So because of the positive output gap, we know wages are going to be driven up. As wages are going to be driven up, expectation of inflation is that it is going to be driven up. With higher expectation of inflation, short-run aggregate supply curve is no longer going to remain constant at AS1. In fact, it's going to now reflect this higher expectation of inflation and therefore it is going to shift up or decrease to the left. So we have our new short-run AS at AS2. This supply curve is reflecting that expectation is that inflation is equal to pi 1. The actual inflation observed when the economy was at E1. But at this particular point, we have our new equilibrium GDP, Y2, still a positive output gap. So the same process continues. As long as there is a positive output gap, it's going to drive up nominal wages and going to cause our expectations of inflation to be driven up. Short run aggregate supply curve decreases or vertically shifts up. And this process continues till the output gap is eventually eliminated. So at AS4, we have the intersection of AD and short run AS at point 4. So over time, our output gap gap is eliminated and we are back at potential. But in doing so, the cost is that inflation has been driven up to pi 4 in our economy. So we have a very high inflation rate as the economy corrects itself in the long run. Now let's do the same for a recessionary output gap. Here you can see our initial equilibrium is at the intersection of AD and short run AS at E1, where inflation is at Y1, GDP is at Y1, and this level of current equilibrium GDP is lower than our potential. So the economy is facing a recessionary output gap. With output less than potential, there is now slack in the labor market. Workers are now willing to take smaller increases in wages that causes inflation expectations to go down. And as expectations of inflation are driven down, our short run aggregate supply curve will change to reflect this lower expectation of inflation. So current inflation is by one. So the short run AS now is pushed down to reflect this lower expectation of inflation. As short run AS is vertically being pushed down, this is actually an increase in production. And you can see our equilibrium GDP in the short run is now going up. So output gap is now going to be reduced. Now this process will continue as long as we do have some recessionary output gap. Recessionary output gap will continue to put downward pressure on expectations of inflation. Short run aggregate supply curve keeps getting pushed worse vertically down or increasing till the gap is eliminated over time. So at point 3, which is our short run equilibrium point for the economy, AD and AS are intersecting. But this level of GDP is also corresponding to our potential level. So the economy has self-corrected itself.
itself in the long run as output moves towards its potential low. Recessionary output gap, however, puts downward pressure on our inflation rate. Inflation, you can see, has now gone down considerably compared to our initial level. So in this analysis, we have seen that the self-correcting mechanism ensures that the output will always move towards its potential level in the long run. And this mechanism primarily depends upon wages being pushed up or down, and that is going to change the expectations of inflation and that eventually closes the output gap. So the self-correcting mechanism can be very fast or can be very slow. If it's slow, then we're working with very inflexible wages. And here we might see need for active government policy or monetary policy intervention to close the output gap. However, when wages and prices are very flexible, then this self-correcting mechanism will transpire out very quickly and rapidly. And then there will be less need for any type of policy intervention, whether it's fiscal or monetary policy. We can now look at different type of shocks that generate the business cycle. We will start with assuming there's a positive demand shock when the economy was initially at its long run equilibrium level. So that is our short run ES are intersecting at a point such that your GDP is equal to its potential level. Inflation is currently at pi one and we are at equilibrium E1 in the economy. A positive demand shock will increase our aggregate demand curve and shift it to the right. It could be because of autonomous monetary policy easing. It could be because of autonomous consumption, government's purchases, planned investment spending or autonomous net exports going up. It could be any of those factors that we have seen that shift demand curve, but putting a positive pressure on aggregate demand. Our new short run equilibrium is at point two, where your AS and AD are intersecting. And this gives you a much higher level of real GDP and a higher level of inflation. So that is our short run impact on the economy as a result of this demand shock. Now notice that in the short run, GDP is higher, inflation is higher, and unemployment has gone down. But in the long run, Let's see what happens because of this positive demand shock. In the long run, we will observe that there's a positive output gap and this will cause our expectations of inflation to eventually change. So in the long run, wages are going to be pushed up uh, with the expectation that wages are going to go up, expectations of inflation are going to go up. And with higher expectation of inflation, we are no longer working with our original short run AS. This short run AS will now in fact shift up or to the left. So we have our new short run aggregate supply, AS3. At E2, as inflation was driven up, expectations of inflation are also driven up. And this process will continue till the output gap is eliminated. Note that as the short run AS decreases, output gap is becoming smaller and smaller and eventually it will go back to its potential level. So at E3, output is at potential. Inflation, however, is much higher at Y3 and unemployment is back to its natural rate. So our demand shock has no impact on the economy except for the inflation rate. Inflation is the only thing that emerges out of a positive demand shock in the long run. In the short run, yes, it creates more employment, more jobs and lower unemployment, but that is only a temporary effect. In the long run, its lasting impact is only on the price level or on our inflation rate. Likewise, we can think, consider a situation where we have a negative demand shock. And this is what happened when we had autonomous monetary policy tightening in the 1980s in order to bring the inflation rate down. So we start at point one, where inflation is at pi one, output is at potential. But this level of inflation rate is considered to be now too high by Bank of Canada. So autonomous monetary policy tightening will increase the real interest rate, dampen AD, and this is now going to shift AD to the left. And as AD decreases, we are at point two. Inflation has gone down, but our GDP also has gone down. So both inflation and GDP are going down in the short run. The cost of bringing the inflation down in the short run is high unemployment. Now in the long run, we have an output gap. In this case, it's a recessionary output gap. Workers are willing to now take smaller increase in their wages and therefore as wages adjust in the long run, expectations of inflation are driven down. Our short run aggregate supply curve will shift vertically down to reflect this downward expectation of inflation or increase to the right. So short run AS is now increasing to the right and this gap will become smaller and smaller till we're eventually back to our potential level. So GDP is increasing till we reach our potential level. Again, we see a negative demand shock will have no lasting impact on our real GDP. Output goes back to its potential level. However, it does cause temporary increase in our unemployment rate, lower GDP in the short run. The lasting impact of a negative demand shock is disinflation in the economy. Overall, you can see inflation has been driven down from pi one 
all the way to pi 3. And this is what our economy experienced in the 1980s. In order to deal with these very high inflation rates of almost as high as 12.5%, autonomous monetary policy tightening reduced inflationary pressure. And eventually we are now working with very low inflation of about 3.9% by mid 1980s. Now let's look at our aggregate supply shocks. Aggregate supply shocks can be temporary. In this case, they will now only shift our short-term aggregate supply curve. So they could be coming from changes in our expectations of inflation, they could also be coming from supply shocks or inflation shocks. Then we have permanent supply shocks and permanent supply shocks are going to affect our potential GDP. So the long run aggregate supply curve itself will also shift along with our short run supply curve. So let's look at an example of a temporary negative supply shock first. This could be an example of which is a major import or commodity used in production processes going up. We saw something like this from 73 to 79 when price of oil kept shooting up. Now, high price of oil is a major cost for firms and therefore it causes short-run aggregate supply curve to shift to the left or up and as a result we have higher inflation and lower GDP in the economy. This combination of higher inflation and lower GDP is referred to as stagflation. What happens in the long run? In the long run again we will observe what type of output gap are we facing. A recessionary output gap would cause again wages to go up at a much slower pace therefore cause expectations of inflation to go down. As inflationary expectations are reduced, short-run aggregate supply curve will shift down or increase to the right. With the short-run aggregate supply curve increasing to the right gradually, we are actually in fact going back towards our original short-run AS1 and economy goes back to its potential GDP over time and inflation in fact also goes back to its initial level by one. So temporary supply shocks have no lasting impact on your GDP or on your inflation. Both will eventually be corrected by the self-correcting mechanism of the economy. If it was a temporary positive supply shock, short-run AS would have increased to the right initially, putting downward pressure on inflation and higher GDP. But the self-correcting mechanism will again take both of these macroeconomic variables to their original level at E1. Permanent supply shocks refer to the fact when our productivity changes, so when our potential GDP is no longer the same as before. It could be because of regulations that cause the economy to be less efficient. It could be because of endemic corruption in the economy. It could be because of a major war that is destroying your labor, capital and current technology. In this case, we will see an immediate impact in the economy in the form of higher prices and higher inflation because a negative permanent supply shock will also affect your short run AS. In the long run, the economy will now converge to its new potential. This theory that most of business cycle fluctuations arise because of permanent changes in our potential GDP is called the real business cycle theory. It essentially says that demand and temporary supply shocks are not the ones that are generating our business cycle. In fact, the business cycle is primarily gen generated because of permanent changes in our long run aggregate supply curve. Let's look at how the ADS model will explain to us the step by step mechanism in the case of a permanent negative supply shock. So we are initially at point one at our long run equilibrium, output is at potential and inflation is at pi 1. Now, if there is a negative permanent supply shock, it will affect my long run aggregate supply curve and our short run aggregate supply curve. Note, both have decreased to the left, but there's a much bigger decrease in our long run aggregate supply curve because changes in your productivity are felt more drastically in the long run. In the short run, you can see my equilibrium is no longer 0.1. Our short run equilibrium is given by 0.2 with our AD constant. AD and short run AS are now intersecting over here and inflation has gone up compared to before and GDP has fallen compared to our initial level. So we are again experiencing stagflation in the economy, stagnating GDP accompanied by higher inflation level. Now, if we let the economy be, it will again go through the self-correcting mechanism. Self-correcting mechanism always happens in the long run because wages change very gradually and therefore the expectations of inflation also change typically slowly. So in the long run now we have to observe what type of output gap do we have. Our current GDP is Y2 but note that this GDP is now a lot higher than our new potential. So we are now going to deem this potential GDP YP1 as redundant. It doesn't matter anymore. We are now working with our new potential. The economy in its self-correcting mechanism is going to treat it as if it's an inflationary output gap or a positive output gap. And we know whenever we are producing higher than our potential level, we are overheating our resources, with the labor market is quite tight, it is going
going to cause wages to be driven up and therefore inflation expectations are going to be driven up. As expectations of inflation are driven up, short-run aggregate supply curve is going to shift up or decrease to reflect this to reflect this change in expectations of inflation. And as the short-run AS shifts up or decreases, you can see our output gap is now becoming smaller and smaller over time till we eventually reach to point three where the output gap is completely eliminated. The initial impact of the shock caused our GDP to move from Y1 to Y2, but in the long run, you can see GDP reduces further to its new potential. Inflation in this case is now a lot higher than before. It's actually in fact at pi three, which is considerably higher than our initial inflation rate. So we see in the long run economies that are experiencing stagnation in their GDP or slow growth accompanied by high inflationary environments are economies which must be seeing permanent changes in their potential GDP. This could be because of endemic corruption, political instability, wars, anything that is causing their long term sources of growth to decline rather than go up. Alternatively, permanent positive supply shock would just be the opposite of this. It would cause disinflation in the economy in the short run and higher GDP. So economies which are seen in the long run as experiencing continuously high growth accompanied by lower and lower inflation rate, we can conclude that they must be experiencing permanent changes in their productivity and technology, which is causing their potential GDP to be a lot higher than before. So today we looked at the three components of the ADES model, the aggregate demand curve, short-run aggregate supply curve, and then the long-run aggregate supply curve. After analyzing the factors that can cause them to change, we also looked at our equilibrium analysis. And with our equilibrium analysis, we can conclude that any shift in the aggregate demand curve affects our GDP in the short run only in the long run AD shocks do not impact our GDP at all they only have a lasting impact on our inflation rate temporary supply shocks have no impact on GDP or inflation in the long run. They only cause deviations from potential and our target level of inflation in the short run. In the long run, they bring both GDP and inflation rate back to their initial levels. And lastly, a permanent supply shock affects both GDP and inflation. Output is going to be permanently increased to a higher level if it's a positive permanent supply shock and inflation is going to be reduced. Conversely, if it's a negative permanent supply shock, it's going to cause last impact on your GDP, potential GDP will now be a lot lower than before and accompanied by very high inflation rates. So that brings us to the end of this chapter. We looked at business cycle fluctuations and we saw how the ADS model explains them. Next time we'll be analyzing the ADS model in terms of the monetary policy. So how autonomous monetary policy changes can be used to bring stability to the business cycle.